Okay, I have that at 5.30. So uh, with that, I would like to um, call to order this meeting of the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District for September 1st. Holly, would you like to call the roll? President Mayhood. Here. Vice President Ackman. Here. Director Fulz. Here. Director Hill. Here. Director Smalley. Here. Okay. Are there any additions or deletions to the closed session agenda? I'm sorry. Uh, staff has none for the closed session agenda. Okay. And I, let's see, I'm just seeing if we have, we do have one attendee um, here. So uh, I'll just ask, this is uh, the time when we have oral communications regarding items in the closed session. Um, and would anybody like to speak to that? If you do. Uh, hand, is, hand is up. It looks like that hand is up. Let's go ahead and um, hear what you have to say. Unmute. No, now maybe you There you go. You should be able to speak. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for uh, hearing me. Uh, this is a, uh, we, I tried to get our application for a long line permit. Uh, okay, in, um, excuse me. Usually we like members of the public to identify themselves, say where sure. they live. Sure. Um, and I'm and yeah, I my, guess, uh, yeah. And so yeah. the question is, is whether you really want to be talking to us now because um, whether your question has to do with the closed session agenda. I, you know, that, I don't know if it does or doesn't. I, I'm I don't think it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> so so I, I, I hate to, to put you off, but this, you're, uh, if you're talking about a long line installation, it really needs to come in the uh, open session when we also have at 6.30 the same sort of thing. The open oh. session begins at 6.30. Yeah. Oh, okay. That, that's, yeah, it, Thanks, it's a little Holly. confusing, but that's when you should sign in. And we'll okay. have you then, okay? Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. I'm sorry. No, no I'll, I'll come back. No okay. worries. <laughs> okay, um, with that, we'll go ahead and adjourn to closed session. I have that it's 6.30. So let's go ahead um, and reconvene our meeting of the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Holly, would you like to take the roll call? President Mayhood. Here. Vice President Ackerman. Here. Director Fulz. Here. Director Hill. Here. Director Smalley. Here. Okay. Um, I would like to ask our district council, Gina Nichols, to report out uh, what uh, action is taken in closed session. Thank you, Chair May Hood. Uh, the report out of closed session is that the board voted unanimously to authorize 
the district's labor negotiators to give notice of the district's intention to engage in negotiations with union representatives regarding the classified employees memorandum of understanding with the district. Thank you, Gina. Okay, are there any additions and deletions to the agenda? Yes, uh, Chair, staff would like to uh, remove uh, item 11A authorization to shop for replacement vehicles. Uh, staff wants to provide additional information that syncs uh, to the board that's pertinent to this item. We would like to be able to bring this back uh, at our next board meeting. Okay, so noted. Okay, now is the time for oral communications from the members of the public on issues that are within the purview of the district but are not on the agenda tonight. And I think we had one gentleman that we, um, who has now appeared an hour later, and this is your chance to go ahead and uh, speak. Please identify yourself and where you live. Hi, Gail. My name is Randy Agner. I live in Felton, but I'm actually calling on behalf of my brother who lives up uh, off of Ziani. Okay, go ahead. Um, we've been trying for, we tried to get uh, like three or four days before your prior board meeting to get a long line agreement uh, in front of you for approval. And I think there, for whatever reason, it didn't make that agenda. And then two weeks later, now it's not on the agenda today. So I'm trying to see if we could get that approved and in front of you. Uh, my My brother and is without water right now. Uh, their well went dry, so they've been trucking water. And we've jumped through a lot of hoops to get to this point. And this is gonna be the uh, the one item that's gonna be holding us up now. Um, we're actually in the middle of construction uh, of putting the lines in. We've gotten uh, permits. We've paid our Ziani Hill sand fees. Uh, we're getting two properties annexed to go into this, which are actually coming on uh, in six days or they're going in front of the board to be approved for that. So we've gone a long way trying to get this done and I, I really didn't want to wait another two weeks to get approval on that. Okay, um, Rick, did you want to respond to that? Uh, well, um, these, uh, I think there's three or four services that are coming with this group. Yes, they do uh, need uh, long service line agreements. They also, uh, a couple of the parcels do need annexation into the district. LAFCO um, is going, these services are going in front of the LAFCO board uh, on the 7th for uh, annexation into the district. The service long service line agreements will be coming to the board uh, at our next meeting. Uh, and we uh, are moving uh, this forward. Um, annexations and long service line agreements do take time uh, to get uh, through the process. Uh, we were unaware, at least I was unaware that um, the customers are out of water or hauling water because there are ways that we could have went to LAPCO and um, got an emergency uh, approval to um, supply water uh, outside of the district. Um, but this will be in front of the board and we will get this scheduled. And if they are actually out of water, we can move this pretty quickly um, through the process to get it installed. Thank you, Rick. Bob? Yeah, I just had a clarifying question for Rick. Does that mean, Rick, that you could go to LAFCO tomorrow and say, the, these folks are out of water, we need to do something emergency? We could. Yes, we could. Could we do that? I, but whether I can get that installed, um, if they're, I mean, they're hauling water, it, it sounds like, um, and we can uh, ask this customer to um, to give us some more information. But I, I would not be able to get it installed uh, tomorrow, Bob. It would be the first of next week. No, no, I, I get that. But we get LAFCO's permission tomorrow and install it. Tuesday or Wednesday yeah, or something. We could do that. And, you know, most likely because Joe uh, Sharano, the executive director of LAFCO, did send me an email um, beginning of the week and, and said that they would be hearing these on the 7th. Uh, I could contact LAFCO and uh, they do have provisions to allow when someone is having a hardship that is out of water. Can, Can, you, hear me? Can you hear me, Rick? Yes, go ahead. I, I'm not asking for something 
uh, uh, today. Um, what I'm asking for is if we could get the long line agreements approved through SLV Water District, then we can get on their list to start doing the installation for the meters. But if I have to wait another two weeks and then it takes two or three weeks to get the meters installed, now I'm five weeks down the road. The last I understand that. And it's my understanding that you've already are being in the scheduling queue to have those in. You know, we anticipate the LAFCO will go through and I can't speak for the board, but I anticipate our board would approve these long service lines, especially that you've done all your sand hills work and so forth. I, I am anticipating that. So it'll move relatively quick. And then you have, you all have some significant uh, fees to pay as well. Correct. Mr. Hood, if, if yes, I may. please, please go ahead, Jana. Yeah, for, for Brown Act reasons, I, I recommend kind of curtailing this discussion since it yeah. isn't on this evening's agenda. Um, the, the discussion has to be brief in nature. But th thank you for reminding me of that. Um, I, I noticed, Jamie, you had your hand up. Is there something quick that you just wanted to add? I don't think I would. I would just open up a new avenue, and that wouldn't be appropriate. Okay. I, I think let, let's let's not do that. So I guess I would I would just suggest that um, uh, Mr. Agner go ahead and and contact Rick and and tell him what the real situation is because I think before tonight Rick did not realize that, that anybody was out of water, and that does change things a little bit. So um, he needs to to have that information. Okay, onward. Any other um, oral communications? Okay, um, uh, there is no president's report, so we will go ahead uh, with our first unfinished business, which is the outreach contract award. Rick? And uh, the environmental manager, Ms. Blanchard, will present this uh, to the board. We'll start, we'll start it. Good evening, okay. everyone. I'll turn it over to you, Carly. Okay. So as mentioned, this item is in regards to the district awarding a contract for a comprehensive, comprehensive outreach consultant for fiscal year 22 and 23. As some background, the administrative committee began discussions around the district's outreach in February of 2022. During these conversations, staff indicated that there were additional communication needs, including polishing in-house running communications, technical writing, event planning, social media posting, and best management practices determining ways to engage customers, content development, and the ability for the consultant to represent the district professionally in both written and in-person communication. The work identified above would be in addition to the ongoing communications and social media, which are currently supported by the Buzz PR on a month-to-month -month basis. Those services typically include newsletter creation, social media content, and scheduling, and as-needed graphic design at a cost of $35.60 monthly. In May, the Administrative Committee recommended releasing a request for a proposal or RFP for a comprehensive outreach consultant and increasing the outreach budget from $35,000 to $50,000. At the May 19th Board of Directors meeting, the board voted to move ahead with the RFP but did not approve increasing the budget to $50,000. The Administrative Committee approved the RFP to be released in June and the RFP closed on July 28th with three proposals received. Attached are the proposals from Dudek, Exhibit A, the Buzz PR Exhibit B, and Miller Maxfield Inc. Exhibit C. During the August Administrative Committee, the committee discussed all three proposals, but was unable to come to a consensus and opted to recommend both Miller Maxfield Inc. and Dudek to be considered by the full board before making a final determination. References for both recommended consultants were positive, with each reference stating that the consultant performed within schedules, budgets, and were successful with their outreach projects. However, Dudek's references were more project focused and did not reflect an ongoing agency focused public outreach um, compared to Miller Maxfield. Staff recommends the contract be awarded to Miller Maxfield Inc., who best demonstrated a strong understanding of the local area, ability to understand local water policy issues, and the ability to meet all the needs outlined in the RFP. Miller Maxfield is currently the outreach consultant for the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency, which the district is a member agency of. Um, is working with other local similar size water districts and has experience working with the water district already. Uh, the recommendation is that the board of directors review this memorandum and authorize the district manager to select and award Miller Maxfield Inc. a comprehensive outreach services contract. Okay. Rick, did you want to add anything before I turn to members of the board? 
No, I think I think Carly pretty well summarized. Um, you know, we we have worked with uh, Miller Maxfield in the past doing district outreach. Um, we we do have a, a, a working relationship with them, and of course the Santa Margarita uh, Groundwater Agency. Um, and I, I thought what I really was impressed by Miller Maxfield was his understanding of the different communities in the San Lorenzo Valley. I thought he hit that out of the park in his proposal that he understands our needs. And we'll have a unique area um, that we're outreaching to. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Chair. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and start with Jamie since she chairs the admin committee. Um, so I will be um, moving the staff re staff recommendation to award the contract to Miller Maxfield. Um, the admin committee, and this is you know one of the downsides of being down a committee member, which we are still in you know attempting to um, find committee members for admin committee. If anyone knows anyone, but um, you know we uh, we're not able to come to a, a decision. Uh, at the most recent admin committee meeting, um, there were two clear uh, proposals that stood above, um, you know, both Dudick and Miller Maxfield, I think, put together, you know, really compelling proposals and both have, you know, clear expertise in the industry. But the reason that I am, um, uh, you know, I prefer the Miller Maxfield proposal um, is several fold. Um, one, uh, Miller Maxfield, you know, is working in our communities doing this work. And Dudick, um, even though they they do technically have a Santa Cruz office, their their Santa Cruz office is not where their communications work is being done. That's being done out of an office um, in Southern California. And so those the the that staff that would be doing that work would not necessarily be local. And I I really like the idea that Miller Maxfield has employees who are here in our community. I think that that's really important when you're doing community outreach. I think it's vital when you're trying to do, you know, a, a community oriented event like we've talked about wanting to do with some of these big issues coming up. Um, and so, you know, I, I for that reason, um, I gravitate towards Miller Maxfield's proposal. And then secondarily to that, I think that they just really understand our community. They have done um, work that spans the spectrum from political work to more straightforward education and informational kinds of work, and that really sort of depends on the needs of their client from what I can see. I know there were some concerns about um, that they they do, do political campaigns, and so we didn't want to leave the impression with our ratepayers that we were hiring them for political reasons, but I'm really confident that with the direction um, of staff of Carly and Rick, and of course our direction is board, that they will not be, um, you know, that they will take our direction in terms of the message that we want them to communicate to our um, community. Um, so, uh, you know, but but going beyond that, they have established a real understanding of what our what influences our community. And I would point to the most recent No on Measure D campaign, which Miller Maxfield ran, and um, the San Lorenzo Valley of all of the parts of Santa Cruz County that voted against um, Measure D in this most recent round. San Lorenzo Valley came out strongest against it. Um, and I, I credit some of that to the good work that Miller Maxfield did. So I think that that's further evidence that they really understand our community. Um, so with that, I, I think I'll um, turn it back to the rest of the board. Okay. Um, did you want to officially, you sort of said you wanted to move something. Did you want to move it now? Or I will move the staff recommendation that the um, board authorize the district to select an award Miller Maxfield for the Comprehensive Outreach Services contract. Okay. I'll, I'll second that. Okay. Um, that doesn't mean that I will put it up for a vote yet, but we just... It, we're required if we have a motion to take a second, and now we can still have discussion of it, okay? And we'll obviously go out to the public too. But the motion is now on the table. Um, Bob, let's go to you since you're the second, uh, you're the other board member that's on the admin committee. Yes, and I think the main issue that we have in front of us here uh, that requires um, community involvement in education actually plays much better into Dudex uh, strengths as a company. Uh, Miller Maxfield is, and I have a much longer history perhaps with them than than um, other board members, maybe not 
Jamie, I think you might have worked with them before. Um, but I do not see them as being able to adequately uh, address those particular items. And that's particularly around the, the raw water um, supply pipeline. Um, I think they are mostly uh, political in their approach. And I also have uh, concerns about uh, some of the ways in which they manage their projects relative to change requests, additional funding, that sort of thing. I'm uh, highly skeptical that they'll be able to meet these objectives within the uh, context of the budget that was presented, regardless of what has been put in front of us. Uh, and again, that's based on, on history. Um, my main objective, personally, for this next phase is to make sure that we are providing the best educational information we can to our community about what needs to happen to restore our raw, raw water pipeline. And I, I just don't believe Miller Maxfield is up for that. I don't believe, by the way, Buzz is either. Um, I have serious concerns about Buzz as well. I believe that organizing um, uh, the community events that we're talking about, it can be done by them and it doesn't require people to physically be here all the time. Um, you know, we, we do a tremendous amount of work remotely now and where necessary, people do travel to where they need to be or they get people locally to do that. Um, and they indicated um, their uh, commitment to making sure that can be done. Uh, so that's why I supported DUDEC in the uh, committee uh, discussion. By the way, I do think, uh, as an aside, it was a very good discussion. It's the kind of discussions that we should have in committee. I thought that um, Jamie led the discussions really well. Um, and I think all the points came out during that uh, committee meeting. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, it's now to the board to make that final uh, decision. So thank you all. Jeff? So I have one question here on Miller Maxfield at the moment. Um, I noticed in their work that they've done work for several, what I would call local water agencies. Uh, are they currently doing any work for anyone other than Santa Margarita? And is there any opportunity or possibility of a conflict of interest if they're doing uh, a neighboring water district? They are, they do do work, I do believe for Scotts Valley Water and they do do work on and off for the other uh, local water districts. So, so Cal Creek. So Cal and Santa Cruz. Yeah. So do Could we, I do we see I guess, I guess Jeff, I, my response on that was, I, I actually am less concerned about that as a potential conflict of interest as, as just the opposite <laughs> in that because they're doing this kind of work for other agencies, um, and I have looked very closely at what um, they've done for Santa Margarita, is, is they, they know a lot. <laughs> and they know a lot about the issues. They've got a lot of the diagrams already cooked up. You know, in other words, we're, we're in a position where we can, given that we're talking about a contract where we're putting it a maximum of 50,000 and we're basically paying them on an hourly basis. If we can piggyback on work that they're essentially have already created for other agencies, um, that's a plus in, in my mind. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't, I don't see where there's going to be a conflict of interest, um, especially because, well, I, I don't, I don't see it. And I think it's potentially a positive. Jamie, I sort of, I think I interrupted you. It's okay. We were speaking to the same thing. I wanted to just speak to the conflict of interest concern um, because I have hired a lot of these kinds of public affairs firms in a public affairs role. And, and often um, there are always fewer firms like a Miller Maxfield that serve public sector kind of agencies and interests um, than there are typically like private sector um, PR side kinds of um, agencies. And uh that it is very common that you have, you know, a public affairs firm that's kind of done a piece of work for, you know, the city of Santa Cruz, the city of Capitola, SoCal, you know, I mean, it's, it's, this is, that is very normal. Um, the conflict of interest would only come up if we had some kind of like a, a crisis, right, that, that maybe involved Scotts Valley, some, some, 
main break, I don't know, that maybe impacted some of their property or something like that, right? That they, that would, you know, put them in kind of a, an issue where maybe we don't want to have them be the person to speak to that because they also work for Scotts Valley. But those kinds of things are like really rare and highly navigable and they have to sign all kinds of, you know, um, um, you know, paperwork for us as part of the contracting process to ensure our interests um, when they're working for us. So I, I would be very comfortable that there wouldn't be a conflict of interest concern. But I did also want to speak to the concern about um, Miller Maxfield and whether or not they could adhere to budget. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure exactly where that comes from. Um, but, you know, I appreciate that, that you know, the district has done work with them in the past, and perhaps there have been times when they've had change orders on the contracts. Um, I would say that we, it's very likely um, that had we gone out and interviewed um, Dudix clients, we would find that they too have change orders on a number of their contracts because that's just a very typical process. Um, so I'm not sure that that's a compelling reason either way. And I would also say that Dudic, um, you know, Overall, um, their communications arm is a subgroup to their engineering and environmental services group. That's the main thrust of what, um, what Dudic does. They are not a public affairs agency. They have a public affairs arm of their organization that does some of that work, likely in concert with many of their engineering and environmental projects for clients. But Miller Maxfield not only is a public affairs firm, but they're a local public affairs firm. Um, so. I just wanted to speak to those issues. Okay, Bob, I'll come back to you after everybody's had a chance to speak. Mark? Yes. Um, <clears throat> to the education point, um, they worked on the groundwater um, information uh, session that was put on at the Felton Community Hall in 2019. Um, I attended that uh, seminar that was put on I was extremely impressed by the level of information that was being presented by the organization, by the speakers that were there. And um, I counted no less than 135 uh, folks attending that session. So I thought that that was very well done from that perspective. Um, Miller Maxfield's executive summary uh, describes the valley, uh, unique aspects. Uh, but they they focused it on the valley um, versus I Dudex I found to be generic, um, and I think you could change um, change a few words as to the water district as to Santa Clara or San Lorenzo Valley Water District and make it Santa Clara Valley Water District, and and Dudex proposal would have equally applied. In addition to that, um, Dudex lead, Jane Gray, says right in their proposal, she's based in Encinitas. Um, so I got the feel from reviewing both proposals that Miller Maxfield was the better of the two. So that's my two cents on it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I, I read all three proposals uh, when it were, they were presented in the admin committee uh, packet. And so I'd actually sort of already tentatively made up my mind before I eventually watched the uh, uh, tape of the admin committee discussion. And I feel very strongly um, that Miller Maxfield is, is the person, is the group that we should be um, hiring. I think we've all noticed that Buzz just is not up to the mark in terms of their technical ability. And I guess one of the things I expected going into this was that Dudek, because they're an engineering firm, would have um, an especially strong grasp on the technical aspects of this. And so when I read the proposal, um, I had very much the response that Mark did. Is It's over 30 pages long, but all of it except one page is, is generic, it's just, you know, it could be any proposal. But what alarmed me most was, I'm just gonna read you one sentence here from the one page that's on um, San Lorenzo Valley, and I could do more, that shows that they have no understanding what our current system situation is. And if they can't get that right for a proposal, 
I just can't imagine um, how this is going to go forward. So the sentence I'm just picking here is the primary district water source has historically been surface water. Untrue. We've been 50-50, groundwater and, prime, and uh, surface water. However, due to the fire's adverse effect on surface water quality, the district now primarily relies on groundwater. Not true. Um, as soon as we brought uh, the water online in the North system, it was good enough to use. We're not mostly dependent on groundwater. We only switched over to groundwater in uh, June. So this shows that they do not have a grasp of what's going on in, you know, in technically. And that was where I expected them. And then they go on and say the groundwater, the reason we shouldn't use it is because the aesthetic aspects of, you know, that it's got more dissolved solids, when the real reason is because of Santa Margarita and the rules that have to do with sustainable groundwater. And they don't even mention that. And this is a huge issue for us, is how we are engaged with Santa Margarita. So I, I, I was shocked that, that an engineering firm could be so off the mark on this. Um, I, I have paid a lot of attention to what um, Miller Maxwell has done for Santa Margarita because I've been watching Santa Margarita since those first uh, meetings that you described, Mark, that, that I went to that I thought a lot of the diagrams they produced were very effective and the whole thing was, was pretty compelling. Um, but what I've really liked about their work is that it's technically accurate, it's visually appealing, um, and it's appropriate both at the level of, of, you know, who we should be pitching this at, but also the scale. It's not overly glitzy. You know, I, I think that people in San Lorenzo Valley actually get a little bit nervous or, or uh, you know, if, if something's too glitzy, it, it needs to be at the scale that we operate on. And I think what we're seeing with, with Miller Maxwell is they understand that because they sh they've really showed an accurate in-depth knowledge of the district, the, you know, the actual workings of the district. Um, and they've also really shown, as other people have already mentioned, um, an understanding of the sort of socio-political landscape that we have to navigate as a water district. And so I, I came away after reading all of these proposals very strongly that I thought Miller Maxfield was the one that we should um, hire. Okay, Bob, I said I'd come back to you. Well, I, I appreciate that, uh, there are a number of things in, in there, um, but I won't belabor the point too much. Um, yeah, I, you know, I was at that same meeting in 2019, um, and I don't recall much of the content there actually being produced by Miller Maxfield. There were, there were a series of presentations from experts uh, who actually produced the content. I think they organized the event. Um, in fact, I think there were a couple of them. Um, okay, I mean, I, I see where we're going. Um, I am skeptical. Um, I guess we will see. Uh, we'll see how that all turns out. I, you know, Miller Maxfield is a sales organization, and I am concerned that the information we're going to put together is going to be more of a sales job as opposed to an education. And I think what we really need to do is make sure we're educating people about what uh, the situation is. So as a community, we can reach a consensus. I don't know that Miller Maxfield is up to that, but I guess we will see. Can I go out to uh, members of uh, the public? We have Oh, wait, Josh Wolf, you're not a member of the public. You're, you should be in the money. Yeah, I was going to say, why is he in there? <laughs> no. Well, um, I, anyway, uh, we have both Cynthia and Mark Dolson. So, Mark, you've got your hand up. Let's go ahead and hear from you. There we go. There you go. I think I've successfully unmuted. I, th I thought I would say a few words because I'm uh, a public member of the admin committee and I don't think you really require my input regarding your decision, but I did want to share a little of what transpired at our two August meetings on this topic because I, I personally found it frustrating and, and uh, would like to call a little more attention to the process. So from my perspective, there were, there were really two key issues that, that I would like the board to be able to consider. And one is definitely who should the contract be awarded to, but 
the, the other one is, is how is it that the admin committee spent two hours on this question without producing any any real useful guidance or at least any decision so with, with regard to the first question i would say that staff did in the admin committee meeting initially recommend miller maxfield there was a motion on the table to approve that recommendation Director Ackman voiced concerns about Dudick, similar to what she stated tonight, and uh, Director Fultz voiced concerns about Miller Maxfield, similar to what he stated tonight. I found the concerns from Director Ackman persuasive and not the concerns by Director Fultz. I voiced concerns about the staff's assessment process, particularly with regard to the first admin committee meeting, but I said at the second meeting that I was now satisfied with their recommendation I was prepared to cast the deciding vote in favor of Miller Maxfield so if I were on the board I would similarly be voting for Miller Maxfield tonight but what really surprised me was that in the midst of all that staff suddenly changed their recommendation from Miller Maxfield to either Miller Maxfield or Dudek and I found this to be really the most troubling aspect of, of the whole process but I did go along with the other two committee members in, in approving that new recommendation so that really brings me to my second question which is is the committee responsible for vetting the candidates or is it responsible for vetting the district's vetting process? Because it appears to me there was a lot of confusion on this point and this confusion ultimately wasted two hours of the committee's time. I believe that it's the district's responsibility to vet the candidates and make a recommendation to the committee. I think the district fell seriously short of this responsibility, both in failing to initially provide an assessment and then in that last minute reversal of his recommendation. So as a committee member, I believe that my principal responsibility was to oversee the assessment process. And I think the assessment process was ultimately adequate, but I don't think everyone else was necessarily on the same page. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Jamie, did you wanna to respond to that? I just wanted to add something and I, I appreciate your comments, Mark, and that was, you know, right on the money in terms of some of the challenges that we struggled with um, as a committee. Um, I, I think that what I would add, I, I didn't see um, the, the offer of the um, change in position at the second meeting so much as, as the staff changing their position directly as much as um, the staff was trying to seek a compromise as as my interpretation and my understanding of the way that that unfolded at the meeting. Um, what happened just for a little bit of context for the rest of the committee members is that right now um, we are down a committee member. So we have four committee members. Um, we had one committee member who was supposed to be there and then due to personal reasons was um, not able to be there at the last minute, but um, communicated their preference. And that created a little bit of confusion about, you know, um, how we wanted to proceed um, because we didn't have, uh, because there was a difference of opinion. And so I think that staff was trying to, you know, find a, a sort of elegant way to bring that to a close because we were going to lose our quorum and we hadn't, you know, come to a final vote yet. And so I, I, I appreciate, you know, Mark is right that at that point staff made a suggestion about going a different direction. And, uh, and it sounded like that was going to be the best way to get this to the September 1st meeting so that the board could then consider it, um, in my view, at least in terms of how that unfolded. But... Bob? Yeah, I also wanted to address um, something that Mark said. By the way, if this is not the right time, I'll do it after uh, public comment. But I did have something to address, I think, his second point, which I do think is a very good point to consider. No, I, I think I don't see any other hands up among the public. So I think now is the time. Okay. Um, you know, Mark asked a question about what the process is and what the committee's role is. And um, since I participated in the admin committee when it selected the um, uh, attorneys, uh, well, attorney in this case, Nassiman, we went through a process that was actually very lengthy. Uh, it was actually, I believe, more than two meetings. Um, it, it involved a, a series of interviews in, in person at that time. We could, we could do that. Um, and it involved an extensive discussion uh, on the part of the committee. And it wasn't just the committee um, overseeing the process of how the staff went about the, um, making a selection or recommendation. It actually was the committee itself deeply involved in um, helping make that determination. 
Um, and this may be something obviously for a different meeting. It's not directly in the agenda today, but I want to acknowledge what Mark brought up and said that if there is that kind of dynamic on the committee between are we there for job X or are we there for job Y, perhaps that does need to be um, clarified, at least with respect to the selection of um, uh, consulting um, assistance like legal public relations um, uh, audit firm, if it ever came to the admin committee or budget committee, that sort of thing. I, I think that's a, actually a very good question to ask. My view is that the committee would be involved in actually making the suggestion, not, not a recommendation, not just um, uh, overseeing that the process was followed correctly. I, I agree with you, Bob. It's, a, it's an interesting question. Is Are committees is. there to vet a process or are they there to be more actively engaged in the vetting process itself? And I think that that's, Mark wasn't sure. Um, and I actually don't know the answer to that. <laughs> um, and Gina, if you have any legal um, things to pop in or whether that's really more a philosophical question that the board should, you know, consider of, of how they want their committees to work. Well, I, I think it is more philosophical in the sense that the board policy manual doesn't address it. And yeah. the board policy manual is our policy handbook for what the committees are supposed to do and how. But uh, the other thing that I, I wanted to interject briefly is that I, I, I'm a little concerned for Brown Act reasons of continuing to discuss the function of committees uh, under this agenda item. Okay. All right. Um, we we can come back to that as a separate agenda item at some other point if if we want to. I think I think it's probably worth talking about. Um, okay. Uh, we do have a motion and a second on the table to. Uh, adopt the recommendation by the staff uh, to, let me just get this right, authorize the district manager to select and award Miller Maxfield Inc. a comprehensive outreach services contract. And I've added here for an amount not to exceed $50,000 a year. Is, is that okay? I, I added that from- um, I, would, I would accept the friendly amendment to my motion. I, I just wanted that to, to be clear because we're already spending a certain amount on buzz and I don't want people to think this is 50,000 on top of it. It's, this is replacing that and this will be the total budget. Okay. Um, any further comments or questions about the motion? Well, I, I think Chair made it, I do believe uh, Miller Maxfield's proposal is for 50, is it 53 or do I have that wrong, Carly? It's actually 55. Yes, it's 55. Well, I would ask that uh, you amend that to not to exceed 55. Is that okay with everybody else? I, the board had it earlier just adopted 50, so that was the number. I, I guess I, I had assumed that the, we paid them by the hour um, in any case, right? And it, then it would but, uh, so they're going to bump up against that limit. But I don't believe the board ever approved okay. the increase to 50. Yeah. Uh, we were waiting to come back with ah, the okay. actual proposal and to adjust the budget amount to the proposal. Okay. Right. We did say specifically that that's why we didn't right. adopt an, a new budget was so that we could see what the proposals came in at. Okay. Right. So what you would like me to say is for an amount not to exceed $55,000 per year. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So that's the motion on the table. Um, any comments or questions from the board? Uh, any of the people in the audience? Don't see any? Um, okay. Then Holly, could you take a roll call vote, please? President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Ackerman. Yes. Director Foles. No. Director Hill. Yes. Director Smalley. Yes. Motion passes. Okay, we move on to the next item of unfinished business, which is the remote meeting authorization under AB 361. We're doing this a little early because we're not absolutely sure that we'll, um, well, actually now after the discussion of the long line, maybe we will absolutely have to have a next meeting. But um, that was the reason we did it now, just, just because we were thinking we might not need the next meeting. But is there any reason not to continue with this, Gina? 
Uh, no, there's not. I mean, you, you okay. can't do it too often. It's better to do it too often rather than not have it as well. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> okay. okay. You may disagree that we can do this too often as we <laughs> now been. It feels like it sometimes. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Any questions or comments on this from the board? Mm. How about members of the public? Okay, then I will um, suggest that the board ratify resolution number 4, 2122, proclaiming an ongoing state of local emergency and authorizing remote meetings for another 30 days during the COVID-19 pandemic. Is that suggest or move? Uh, that was, I'm sorry, that was, I was moving that to ratify. I'll second. Motion I'll to second. ratify. I'll second. Okay, a second. All right, any discussion? by members of the board or the public. Seeing none, Holly, would you take a roll call vote, please? President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Ackman. Yes. Director Pulse. Yes. Director Hill. Yes. Director Smalley. Yes. Okay, motion passes. Um, that moves us to the consent agenda. We don't have one tonight. Uh, we don't have any district reports except for the district manager's report. And I know that Rick wants to uh, give a short report having to do with power outages in hot weather. All right, just a, a little quick uh, update here. Uh, I think as you all know that the state of California or the whole Western United States is, is in a extreme heat wave and we're looking at triple uh, digit temperatures uh, through the three-day weekend, with Monday being uh, the hottest day. Uh, PG&E has already sent out uh, notices uh, to be prepared for um, uh, outages, uh, rolling blackouts, et cetera. Um, although we have generators, but these outages cause our large pumps um, uh, problems switching over back and forth. So it's, it's very staff time. And, um, uh, consisting of you know traveling from site to site, the operations department has moved into the um, emergency response. Is making sure all equipment is up and ready to go. We've increased our social me messaging uh, to inform customers that during PG&E outages and and during the heat water the heat wave to be uh, uh, really conserve water. Uh, we've also have. Uh, uh, programmed our, our changeable message lines to be deployed if needed in case of a emergency, which are the big road signs that ask people to conserve water. Um, like I said, social messaging we've updated. Um, uh, we're making sure that we are prepared. This is especially concerning due to the fact that CZU fire has limited our surface water and all of our water into the North Boulder Creek area has to be pumped up through what we call the Irwin Booster, a one choke point facility. Um, that facility has been uh, overhauled. Both pumps are functioning. We've had uh, reps out and looking at it. We've tested both pumps work. And normally, we only use one pump uh, to pump about 350 gallons per minute. With the second pump, uh, we've tested it, it's functional. We can almost double the production up into the Boulder Creek area. But power outages are a huge concern, uh, and so is fire uh, moving into the, the three-day weekend. But we are going into it with our, our storage uh, at 100% or as close to it, and um, hopefully uh, ready if anything was to come up. Well, that that's... Um, thank you for doing that. Very heartening. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I thank you for that, that report. Um, any... Questions or comments on that by members of the board? Okay. Um, we don't have any written communications. So with that, without objection, I will adjourn this uh, meeting for this evening. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. So I show that is 715 adjournment. And thank you very much for your help. Did a great job.